Hi, this is an introduction to philosophy where we pursue some of the ultimate questions the philosophers ask. My name is Mark Thorsby and today we're going to be really beginning with this question in the next two videos looking at the question of what is real? And this is a and we're going to be the, t the title for today's lecture is from mythos to logos. So welcome everyone. I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is this, this sort of question of, well, what exactly is real? Uh, and of course, this is a metaphysical question, if you recall from a couple weeks ago. Um, but we're going, to be do, we're going to be looking at this question in the context of what's known as pre-Socratic philosophy, or the pre-Socratic the pre-Socratics. Um, and the pre-Socratics are these philosophers, from, they're Greek philosophers, ancient Greek philosophers, uh, that predate Socrates. So they existed before Socrates. But you're gonna, we're going to see today that they, in many ways, really attack this question of what is real in a very palpable sense. Now, I've also titled today's lecture From Mythos to Logos, because we're going to see here that, the, that um, in the ancient world, Right, we're used to thinking that in the ancient world, the um, the ancient Greeks had mythologies. Now, the, it actually comes from the Greek her, Greek term here, mythos. And what I'm, we're going to see here is that the pre-Socratics they ultimately replace mythos with logos. Right. So, what is mythos? What do I mean by mythos or mythology? Well, think about it. And here, you may even want to pause the video and ask yourself. What exactly is a mythology? And I'm going to offer you this suggestion. That mythology is a narrative. It's a story that explains the world. Right? That explains the world. A narrative is a story that explains the world. So, for instance, uh, what in the reading today, I had, had in the, before we get into the priest of Crack Flaws, this is the first thing I wanted you to read, which is the creation story of the ancient Greeks that comes from Hesiod in what, the text which is known as the Theogony. Theogony, right? And for instance, you can see here he starts telling the story about the ancient world. Verily, at first chaos came to be, but next, wide bosom earth, the ever sure foundation of all the deathless ones who hold the peaks of snowy Olympus and dim Tartarus in the depths of the wide path earth and arrows love fairest among the deathless gods who unnerves the limbs and overcomes the mind and wise counsel of all the gods and all the men within them. From chaos came forth Erebus and black night, but of night were born ether and day when she conceived and bare from union in love with Erebus. And I'm not going to continue to read it on here, right? But you can see here that what Hesiod's doing is he's giving an explanation uh, of why it is the world is as it is, right? Why there's night and why there's day and why there's these gods that they worship and so on and so forth. And, of course, he's going to tell the story of how Zeus uh, from chaos came um, the Titans, and then from the Titans, Zeus, and the Cyclops, and so on and so forth. But all of these are stories, they're narratives that explain the world. Now, we should say here that we're going to put, we should suspend, or at least separate out the idea that, of whether or not these mythologies or these stories are true or not. Now, none of us, or I think very few of us, believe that these ancient Greek myths are true. So, most of us think they're false. But we should recognize that that a narrative, a story, um, could be true. It may, may be. It may not be true. But the 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 key thing here is to note the form of explanation, right? In in religion as well as in the ancient Greeks um, world, right? But we're going to see that we're going to see a transition here with the pre-Socratics towards logos. Now, what do I mean by logos? Now, we're going to see by the end of today's session, we look at Heraclitus. We're going to see Heraclitus as a very sort of particular sense of logos. But I think we can extrapolate to some degree uh, and say that a, lo a logos is something like a rational explanation of the world. Or I'll put a, yeah, of the world. Let's put that. But it's a rational explanation. Now, the question you should be asking is, what, mean, what do we mean by rational? Well, it means something like this. A rational explanation of the world is an explanation that, that, um, that, that includes evidence for itself, 
right? Whereas a narrative, there is no evidence here. You just accept or not. This is a matter of faith, you might say. Whereas a logos is a matter of evidence and whether or not it's a reasonable explanation of the world. And we're going to see there's this transition in the pre-Socratics from this narrative sort of modality to a logos modality, right? And of course, the term logos today is deeply ingrained in our own language today. Think of the term psychology, right? Both of those are Greek terms, right? For instance, something like the logos of the psyche, or if you will, the language of the soul is quite literally what psychology refers to. Or we might, some might say the logic of the psyche, right? So we're going to see this happening now. This begins, these questions really begin, this transition begins with the philosophers. Now, when we ask the question of what's real, though, uh, we're going to see that the philosophers are looking for a rational explanation of the world. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, wait a second, what's the problem with reality? It seems pretty clear to me that this is real, that I'm really watching this video, that um, I really do have a cup of coffee in my hand, and so forth. So why ask the question of the real or reality at all? What, what's the problem here? Why are we worried about this? Well, I want you to think for a moment. Um, and first off, you have to recognize that um, in order to fully appreciate these ancient pre-Socratic philosophers, we really have to suspend our scientific understanding of the world. Because, of course, our scientific understanding of the world is a rational explanation. But let's suspend it for a moment to sort of see what the mystery that undergirds reality might be. Right? Uh, so think about it for a moment. Think about the fact that I have here a granola bar, right? And for instance, the granola bar exists in the world, and the world is in time, right? So this sort of line here represents the timeline, where we have, you know, at least sort of three top parts of the timeline. We have the present, right? So that right now, the granola bar exists in the present. But of course, at, that's, there will be a future moment, at which point this granola bar will no longer exist, right? I'll eat this for lunch. And it won't exist tomorrow, right? And there's a future, there was a past point, a point in the past, when this granola bar did not exist either, right? Maybe a year ago, I don't know, when, hopefully it's not that old, but um, at some point in the past, this thing did not exist. In fact, almost all of the past, all of human history, this thing didn't exist. So, so that means that we have an object in the present that at one point did not exist, and at a future point will not exist. So that means... When we talk about reality, the first thing we should recognize is what we're talking about existence. Because to say something is real is to say it really exists in the world, right? So, for instance, why is Sherlock Holmes not real? Uh, he's not real because he doesn't have existence. He doesn't have substance in the world, as it were. But this thing does have substance in the world, so we say it's real. But now, but there's, here's the sort of mystery. If something has existence, then how is it the case that in the past there was non-existence? How is it that something can, in some bizarre sense, come from nothing? And how is it that something that exists can turn into nothing in the future? And there's a sort of mystery here. And we're going to see the pre-Socratic philosophers are very interested in this. Another way of seeing it is to say that what we have here is we have the problem uh, we have a we have a problem of change, right? How is it that things are constantly changing? Because quite literally, in order for something to change, right? Let's imagine, for instance, um, something that does change, right? Um, right. Let's. There's an object here uh, at one point in time, and then over some period time frame, it changes, right? It takes on different features, right? We can imagine here a baby, right? Um, to an old woman, right? So how is it that an infinite can change into an old woman? Because think about it, that means that the old woman has literally, uh, the baby no longer exists, right? The baby has lost existence by the time you get to the old woman, but the old woman doesn't have existence when there was a baby, which means that something seems to come from nothing and nothingness seems to come from something. Right? Or back to the granola bar. I will eat this granola bar and quite literally it will cease to, it will, it will disappear out of existence and, it, and whatever it is that it's made of will literally, physically, materially change into me. Right? 
Uh, now, of course, we know physically how that happens with modern science, but put that on pause now and imagine you're one of these ancient Greek philosophers living, oops, here, you're one of these ancient Greek philosophers living in this Greek world, right? Um, and you're living in a time where there is no science. All there is is mythologies, right? You're told, why is the world the way it is? And someone's, and you ask this question as a child, for instance, and someone just recites Hesiod to you. Now, there's some very interesting insights, and I think philosophical insights in Hesiod. But overall, Hesiod pr provides a story, right? And what we're going to see here is that this becomes problem. This becomes insufficient, right? Um, if, uh, actually, you know what? Here's what I want to do. Let me move this into here. Let's see if it'll work. Okay. So let me see if I can make this just a little smaller for you, right? So what I want you to see here, so here's the map of ancient Greece, right? Here's Greece over here. Let me just point out some, some of the key places here that are worth knowing about. Um, right, okay, so over here is Athens, right? So there's where Athens is located. This is actually where we're going to see the philosophers Plato, where we actually saw Socrates last week. Um, all of that's located here. We even talked about the Oracle of Delphi. Here's where Delphi is located. Uh, we're gonna, and then of course, famously here's Sparta. Just pointing out some important places in ancient Greece here. But we're gonna see that all of this, the mainland Greece, is not where philosophy begins. Interestingly enough, in fact, philosophy begins actually over here in this area, which of course is today present-day Turkey, and it begins actually in Miletus with a philosopher by the name of Thales. Uh, and we're going to talk about this today in these pre-Socratic lives. But before we go there, I think there's some interesting things to talk about here. And the first thing is that philosophy begins over here in what are known, what were the Greek colonies. That is, Greek, mainland Greece existed. Athens was there. Sparta was there. But that the Greeks had been sending out, um, and sending out people and building colonies on the other side of the Aegean Sea. And it's interesting enough that philosophy begins with the colonist. Now, we don't know why this happens, but I have a sort of hypothesis that I think is something that may be interesting here. And this is this idea, is that in, in the colonies, right, the Greeks, um, you, you have a much more need for, the colonists have to build their own infrastructure. For, over here, you have a much more settled civilization. But these Greek colonies would have had to been much more self-reliant. Right? They would have had to maintain trade relationships with, from, with Egypt to the east, but they would have, asked, would have had to also plant their own crops and with less people and with less resources. Right? And I think this create, perhaps maybe created something of an ethos of self-reliance. And that is where the ancient Greeks, similar to sort of Americans uh, perhaps, um, sort of thought, well, we are the only ones um, who can help ourselves. And of course, then when you ask these great questions, for instance, what's real? Why are things changing? Right? Imagine them, imagine Thales sitting, uh, watching an olive tree and asking himself, how is it that each season the olives come into existence and then they all disappear and then they cut and they go out of existence and they come back again? There's this sort of cyclical process in nature, and you can imagine this with this ethos of self-reliance, these pre-Socratic philosophers saying, well, we know what we've been told by the bards, by Hesiod and Homer, but that's not enough. We want to know why it is that this is happening, and guess what? We want to give our own explanation. We want to provide an explanation uh, that goes beyond simply just accepting what the poets tell us. And I think it's from here, this notion, that we actually begin to see these pre-Socratic -Soc pre philosophers emerge. Now, as I mentioned before, the first major philosopher we're looking at here is Thales. Now, Thales, unfortunately, we don't have um, any of his writings um, because all of them were destroyed if they ever existed. We have nothing of his. But the reason we know Thales here, we consider him sort of the first pre-Socratic philosopher, is because of, uh, he's so early, and also because Aristotle, as well as Diogenes Laertes, much later, were told a lot about Thales. So we know that he existed, uh, and that he was from Miletus, 
uh, and we know roughly what he believed, but we don't have a lot of specifics. Now, he lived from roughly 625 um, to 547 BC. Right, BC. So, Thales. Now, there's really three things that are important that Thales believed. Um, you know, and I'm going to type these in because I think it might be a little easier for you. The first major thing that he believes is that all things are water. All things are water. This is Thales. This is the first philosophical insight. Now, most certainly, I know some of you are probably thinking, what? What? This is, this, we're learning about this guy? He thought that everything was made of water from everything from granola bars uh, to metal coffee cups to books? That all of these things are made up of water? Why should we accept this? What, what is exactly, what is this about? Well, let's go back to this earlier question we had earlier about change, right? On the one hand, we refer to this to this problem of reality, or we're addressing it by thinking about how is it that things change, given that it looks like they go into and out of existence. Well, think about it. For instance, let's imagine that I have an apple. Here's my, or it's not a very pretty apple, right? And let's imagine that we have a person here, right? If a, when a person eats the apple, literally the apple ceases to exist and somehow turns into that person. This is the phenomena of change, right? And what it would mean is what? That in order for the apple to turn into me, right? In order for me to eat the granola bar and it literally to stop being a granola bar and start being part of Mark Thoresby, it must mean that there's something in the apple and in me that are the same, right? That is, there must be some sort of substrate, right? Some sort of, uh, if you will, um, common denominator uh, that's in both of us, right? I love to using the idea of a common denominator because think about it in mathematics, right? Um, in order to compare fractions, right, uh, seven twelfths, you have to. If you're going to add seven twelfths to one half, you need a common denominator, right? And down here. Both of these things have to be the same. Otherwise, you're trying to compare apples to oranges and it doesn't work. And, and this same idea is what we're talking about here, is that somehow there must be a common denominator physically, or at least materially in terms of our reality, um, that's the same. Otherwise, the apple could turn into me, right? Um, and sort of a good example of this is to think about plastic. Uh, can I eat a, a, a piece of plastic pipe? Or can I eat a PVC pipe? Well, I could eat a PVC pipe, but is the pieces of the PVC pipe going to come into me? My body can't process them because there's no common denominator, if you will, right? Um, so we need some sort of substrate to reality. Uh, this is also referred to as the problem of the one and the many. And we're going to see when we talk about Plato here uh, next week, that this problem comes up again, right? That is, that we have all of these many different things in the world. We have people, we have apples, we have trees. Oops, my, my computer's starting to freeze up. I'm not sure why. Uh, we have trees, right? Uh, we, have all, we have water and so on and so forth. We have all of these different things, and somehow they're all going in and out of existence. They all change, right? Everything that we've ever experienced in the world is in a process and in a state of change, right? Uh, there's nothing that we've ever experienced that will continue to exist forever. So if all of these, if we have all of these many things that are all changing and changing into other things, right? The tree degrades and turns into, I'm sorry, the tree gets harvested as lumber, right? And turns into a house, for instance. The apple um, turns into an apple, right? It, it falls on the ground, seeds are sprouting, you get an apple tree. The person dies, right? Is their ashes are, uh, the person dies, RIP, right? They, we bury their body and somehow their body eventually degrades and turns into the grass above uh, the grave site. The water, of course, gets drunk, right? And it, and it helps nourish a person to exist. So all things turn into other things. There must be a substratum. Then that combines them all. So out of the many, there must be a one, a one substrate, if you will. And so what Thales thought is, well, uh, and is 
he thought that maybe this one literally is water, right? Um, he thought all things are water, right? Now, why would he suggest that all things are water? There's some good uh, ideas for this. Number one is that water he would have recognized as existing in different states, right? He would have known that if you go to the mountains, you have this frozen stuff, snow or ice. And if you just take it down and warm it up enough, it turns into water, right? You take a snowball and you hold it in your hands, and eventually the snowball, one of the two things, either your hands are going to freeze or uh, the snowball is going to turn into a little puddle of water in your hands. And then, of course, you can put that puddle of water over a fire, and then that same stuff turns into gas and vapor, right? And then, of course, the vapor seems to be these clouds, and then you get rain and this sort of thing. So Thales would have recognized that water exists in these various states, and therefore, it looks like water uh, it can have all of these multiple things. Of course, he would also know that we need water, and ever life needs water, right? In fact, today, astronomers search for life in the world specifically by looking for water, right? So it seems like a pretty good explanation, right? Um, you can see here, of course, that today we don't really think that all things are made up of water. But why is Thales so important? Because Thales is really the first person to offer an explanation that is, although maybe not the best explanation, it is, I think, a rational explanation, right? All things are water. Um, he another the other the second thing that Thales believed let me hear if I can get to the end is he believed too right that all things are filled with the gods and we're told the story here that Thales believed this because he looked at magnets right and magnets for him would have been these stones that if you put them near each other they repel uh, they repel or attract each other. They literally seem to move in and out. So Thales then sort of began to believe that, well, everything, including physical inanimate objects, like rocks and cups, must be filled with some sort of principle for life. Um, and he called this the gods, right? Um, the, oh, the last thing that Thales believed is that the earth, let's see here, uh, the earth was on a disk of water. Whoa, what's happening here? Okay, and so what we, and why is this important? Because we see here that Thales starts offering what we might call a cosmology, right? He begins to think about how can we explain the universe itself? and the earth as a total. So we're also told that Thales predicted an eclipse. He was an astronomer and a mathematician. Um, he traveled to Egypt and would do mathematics, right? Um, so Thales is this sort of really important philosopher. We don't have a lot of the details of what he thought. And frankly, a lot of his views we probably find very questionable. But the important thing about Thales is that he's the first person to, to actually ask the question in terms of trying to articulate a rational explanation, right? So it's really more the questions that Thaley raises that are important, right? So you might say he's this first step out of mythology, but you can see here by saying that all things are filled with the gods and this sort of thing, that there is a very almost religious explanation. So this is Thales, right? The next philosopher I want to mention to you is a guy by the name of Anaximander. He also came from Miletus. Let me write his name here for you. Again, my apologies for the bad handwriting. It's very difficult writing on this. I mean, he lived roughly, he was born, we believe, roughly around 612. Um, I don't think, we don't really have his dates in terms of his death. But Anaximander is one of these important philosophers um, who knew of Thales, and he essentially comes right after Thales and, th and, and recognizes the same, the, the problem here. But we'll see that Anaximander, um, he ultimately says that the one, whatever this one is, right, the one, right, this substrate that I was calling earlier, is boundless and infinite, right? And what we're going to see with Anaximander is that Anaximander recognizes that he's, he's dissatisfied with Thales' solution, right? Because the question is, well, wait a second. Um, if all things are made of water, it begs the question, well, what is water made of? 
right? Because after all, water also goes through these changes. Why can't we just ask that? Or another way of thinking is that if why can't we equally say that all things are made up of air, right? Or say all things are made up of fire or something like this. In fact, for the ancient Greek elements, earth, water, fire, and air, that all of these elements, in fact, have their pre-Socratic um, proponents. But here's the thing. Annex may recognize that whatever this substrate is, whatever this stuff is, um, some people, can, you might call it substance X, right? Uh, whatever this substance is that is the same in all of us, the common denominator, it can take all of these different forms. It can take an infinite amount of forms, right? Because whatever this is will turn into me, and then whatever I am will turn into something when I die, and so on and so forth, such that nothing ever is really destroyed. So that means that the one must be infinite. It must be boundless. And in fact, uh, we get a, something of a re I have something of a reconstructed argument here uh, that may sort of help ex explain sort of what Thales is doing here. Not An Thales, I'm sorry, Anaximander. Right, let me make this a little bit bigger for you. Right, it's something like this. Given that any state of thing X, given any state of thing X, it has a beginning. So anything that exists has a beginning. But to explain its beginning, we must suppose a prior state of things W. But W must also have a beginning. So you have this idea that you have the coffee cup, but there must be a prior state before it's a coffee cup, right? It may just be metal, sheets of metal. But the sheets of metal must also have a beginning, so there must be another pre previous state, or, or something like this. But you can see here, the succession can't go on forever, because if it goes on forever, there is no beginning. And if there is no beginning, there can be no end. So whatever this thing is, it's actually infinite. It goes on forever, right? Uh, and it's infinite in this sort of sense. And he actually used the term here, the Greek term is the apiron. Right, and this is what what he called the boundless. And you can see here. I think what we see with the Anaximander is we see what a further step in terms of the intellectual evolution of the pre-Socratic philosophers, such that now instead of just pointing at something and saying, "Oh, it must be made of water," something you experience here, we have an intellectual abstraction, the boundless. That's literally what the appearance means: the inability to have limit. Right? And so the idea is whatever this stuff is, let's just call it a name, give it a name, and the name is the boundless. Right? Now, of course, the question here that we may have, so the second key point here is um, the appearance. Wait one sec here, let me move this over here. Um, Have I miss well, I think I misspelled. Hold on. Yeah, oops. Okay, the appearance or the boundless. And so he postulates that that's what the thing is. You can see here, I think this is a better explanation. Now, one of the other critical things that Annex Manor also talks about is what's known as the vortex. Now, uh, there's this question, which is namely, okay, well, if everything's made up of water, well, why is everything changing? Not water. If everything is made up of this appearance, there's this boundless stuff, well, why is everything changing then? Is there an explanation for change itself? Because we see here that Thales doesn't really provide much of an explanation. And so one of the things that we think, believe the anti semitic notice is that if you take a, a bucket of water and you fill it with sand and dirt and rocks and this sort of thing, and you start spitting it, and you create a vortex, what you'll see is that the certain size uh, particles will start to group together with the light particles. So the smaller sand will sort of group together as you spin it with the smaller sand, the bigger rocks with the bigger rocks and so forth. And so it seems, so we get this idea that he seems to think that maybe the world is somehow spinning and it's sort of moving around the appearance somehow. Now, it's not the best explanation, but again, the point isn't that his explanation was right. The point is that he's trying to offer an explanation here, right? The other sort of curious thing that he's known for here, for arguing, is that humans were fish. That humans originated as fish. Now, ironically, this has actually been proven to be somewhat accurate, at least when we take into account evolutionary biology. Now, 
uh, none of the fish that exist now, but you can see here that we have sort of what you might see in Agnes Mir, a proto sense of what of evolutionary theory. He thinks that human beings have come from something previous in the same way that everything comes from something prior. He all he says that humans do too. So this is a very early insight, of course. Today we become accustomed to it in many different ways, right? Um, so this is Anaxic Meander, right? Uh, another thing we see with Anaxic Meander is he also seems to tie into uh, his view of the world justice, right? Uh, in fact, we're told that Anaxic Meander says that, um, let's see here. Uh, let me go back. My apologies. Uh, for instance, where Annex Mayor says that existing things make reparation to one another for their injustice according to the ordinance of time, right? So with Annex Mayor, this process of change, this vortex, in some sense, is, is linked up with justice, right? Because uh, he says that existing things make reparation to one another for their injustice according to the ordinance of time. And it's this idea that there's some sort of balancing principle in nature, right? And, and, and it's somehow he links it up with this notion of justice and injustice. So we're, we're sort of just, in these principles, just seeing some early insights. Though next week, for instance, we'll see are much more clearer, much more clearly addressed, for instance, Plato and Aristotle. Okay, another philosopher. Now, there's lots of pre-Socratics, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm going to talk about two more. The next one here is Xenophanes. Xenophanes. Uh, and Xenophanes was from Colophon, uh, which, is, which is also, I don't see it on the map here, uh, but it also is one of these, um, let's see, what is here? Colophon was an island right around here, and this map doesn't have it labeled, but I believe it comes from just right here, right over here. I believe that's where Colophon is. Uh, I hope I'm not misspeaking, since I don't have the right map, so my apologies for that. But he was from Colophon, and Xenophanes, right, he, going back to this distinction between from mythos to logos and mythology, right, the first thing that Colophon recognizes is famous for here is really actually attacking mythology itself we don't see that right he argued that the gods are anthropomorphic projections of human beings right oh there, there's actually a p there right so what does anthropomorphic mean what does this term mean well anthropomorphic means to make something like human right uh, and the gods ate, I mean, the gods are, right? The gods are anthropomorphic projections. The idea that the gods look like humans, and Xenophanes finds this very problematic, right? Let me see if I can pull up for you. Uh, here we go. Right? So, for instance, let's keep going here. Uh... And by the way, you can see here I gave you not just a, uh, the Hesiod, but I also had you take a look at Homer's, um, 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 the Homeric hymn here about nature and how nature evolves and this sort of thing. So, but we see here is Xenophanes, right? Uh, it was Xenophanes, let's see, whoa. Let's see, I'm trying to. Uh, maybe that's his small as I can get it. My apologies. Oh, there we go. Um, right. And here, let me, let's just read what he says here, right? Homer and Hesiod have ascribed to the gods all things that are a shame and a disgrace among morals, stealings and adulterers and deceivings of one another, right? And what you're going to see is that Xenophanes actually directly attacks the ancient Greek religion as problematic, right? He thinks that what's happening here is that they're essentially taking, they're making the gods look like humans, right? The, uh, these gods, for instance, you see, the, and if you read the Iliad, you see um, the gods fighting and using Achilles and Hector as a way to, to fight out their own battles, right? But guess what? That's what human beings do. Is that really what gods do, right? 
Uh, he says, since they have uttered many lawless deeds of the gods, stealings and adulterers and deceivings of one another, but morals deem that the gods are begotten as they are and have clothes like theirs and a voice and form. Yes, and if oxen and horses or lions had hands and could paint with their hands and produce works of art as men do, horses would paint the form of gods like horses and oxes like oxen and make their bodies in the image of several kinds. And the, right, he says, for instance, the Ethiopians make their gods black and snub nosed. The Thracians say they have blue eyes and red hair. The gods have not revealed all things to men from the beginning, but by seeking, they find in time what is better. Right. So Xenophanes' problem here is that the Greek gods can't be true because they're just they look like human beings. Right. And what Xenophanes, though in your reading you don't see it, what he argues, he's not an atheist. He thinks there is one God, right? So he essentially initiates a sort of monotheism philosophically. Now, why would you do that? But think about it. You have this the boundless, the appearing, right, in Anaximander, which explains everything. And, and if you're going to say that the gods created this appearing, the gods are infinite, or this God is, then there can only really be one God. This, and this God has to have certain sorts of characteristics. He thinks, right? This God would be omnipotent, meaning this God can do anything, right? It has it has infinite potential, right? It's omniscient, right? It knows all things, but importantly, it would have to be unmoved. Now, the, this third point here um, bears discussion to some extent. What do I mean by unmoved? Well, okay, let's think about it for a moment. If, if, if all things can change and there's something that's an infinite substrate beneath them, maybe this thing is this God, right? But that means that if God is infinite, God is only one thing, right? Um, but if, and if God's only one thing and infinite, that means that God can't be changed, right? If God can't be changed, then God can't move. Because after all, how is it that we recognize things change? We recognize that things are changing because we see them moving in some fashion or another. So if there's a God that's infinite, that God uh, must also be unmoved. It can't change. So you can see here, that means that the God's that Xenophanes is talking about here is not a personal God. It's not a God that would respond to your prayers because that would be a sort of movement of, of sorts. Okay? So with Xenophanes, finally, we get this, we get a direct attack of Greek religion itself, right? Um, and well, the other sort of thing we see with Xenophanes is that natural explanations rule. Right? That is that uh, it seems that the gods are simply a, something of a poetic personification uh, of human beings, right? And what we really need is we need an explanation for a material explanation, right? And we see that with Anaximander and Thales as well. In fact, definitely with Thales, uh, right? But that natural explanations rule, and that and that simply to sort of kind of tell a story is insufficient. Right, so you see here the, the the increasing collapse of mythology or mythos as an acceptable form of explaining the world, um, and so that's one of the things to use. Now, there are six sort of main points about Xenophanes I'll mention. I'm not going to type all these out, and that's the first one is that I can actually have typed it out, so I can show you what they look like here. Yeah, let's see, I'll make it bigger. Right, Xenophanes de de uh, denies claims of in divine inspiration. So he doesn't think that, for instance, the, um, the the oracles of the Greek religion are true because there is no divine inspiration. There can't be because God's unmoved. Right, um, there is a process of moving towards truth in time. We see this idea in his work. Right, is that slowly things are becoming we're we're moving towards understanding the truth of things. Right. And also this number three here is that even if someone knew the whole of the truth, they wouldn't know it. Right. The truth itself cannot be fully conceived of because the truth is linked up with his notion of God here. But God, if God's infinite, then that in you and um, yeah, God's infinite, then that means that you could never contain that truth. So even if someone knew the whole truth, they wouldn't know that they knew it. Right. Uh, some beliefs are better than others. So, for instance, 
it's better to believe in this um, unmoved, omniscient God than it is to believe in the Greek gods. So he really redirects the question uh, and discovers epistemology here. Remember, epistemology is this theory of knowledge. So he discovers this idea that in order to answer these questions, we have to have an explanation about how we can know what we do think we know. Right? And the one God knows the whole truth. Okay? So let me add here to my third philosopher, which is Heraclitus, who lived around 500 BC. Let me move this over. Whoops. Actually. Right? So the la our last philosopher. I mean, well, uh, right, and uh, uh, our last philosopher is Heraclitus, and he comes from Ephesus, right? Now, there's other great philosophers. Parmenides comes from Samos. And there's lots of other great philosophers, but the one I want to talk about now is Heraclitus, who comes from Ephesus. Heraclitus, somewhere around 500 BCE. Right, Heraclitus of Ephesus. Okay, and there's really sort of three key elements that I want to draw your attention to when we talk about Heraclitus. And the first one is this: is that he says that, or at least he's known for this idea that all things are in flux. All things are in flux, or the idea that, in fact, uh, again, like all these philosophers, especially these pre-Socratics. We don't have their full writings. We know that Heraclitus actually wrote a book called On Nature, but it's been lost to time. All we have are little fragments. that, And those fragments are when people quote, people who did have access to the book quoted Heraclitus, and we have their quotations, and we compiled those together into what are known as the Heraclitian fragments. And this is precisely what I, I've given you to read, <laughs> right here, starting here with the word. Now, uh, the word there is logos, and we see that Heraclitus actually is the actually articulates the word logos, right? Uh, but before we get into this notion of logos, Heraclitus says that all things are in flux, and famously it comes from this, uh, this, this, this fragment here, which is that you cannot step into the same river, this into the same rivers, twice for fresh waters and ever flowing are ever flowing in upon you, right? Or you can't step into the same river twice. What does that mean exactly? Now think about it. when you step into a river, as soon as you step into it, the water you stepped into has now moved over here. And the water that was over here has moved and now you're standing in different water. But of course, as soon as you stand in that water, it's moving on because the whole thing is in a process of flow, right? Um, as it says, for fresh waters are ever flowing in. Right now, think we exist in time, and the idea is that that all things are in constant flow, constant change. Right, and think about it. In the same way that you can't step into the same river twice, you can't be the same person a second time. Right, literally, physically, we know that your body has changed from yesterday, from what it was yesterday, and from the the day before that, and going on and on and on. And Heraclitus recognizes this idea that all things are just constantly in flux. They're constantly changing, right? Um, so that means that that means that things never or never stay put enough for there to be the unity of things, right? We experience, for instance, I experience the coffee cup is never changing, but actually. I know through science today that it is changing. Literally, the molecules are moving around, right? Um, and we believe that Heraclitus recognized not that precise thing about the molecules, but, but, but understood that if things are changing, they're always changing because of time. But if they're always changing, that raises the question, how is it that I can recognize uh, that, that th some things stay the same, right? Uh, so, how is it that I can recognize that things do stay the same over time? And so, he postulates this principle of logos, right? Then we'll put this here, that logos, uh, we'll put, he postulates logos as the principle for the unity of our experience. Right? And he actually uses this term, logos. Now, in the Greek world, in his day and age, logos literally meant to talk, right? Just to talk about something, right? 
Um, but we, we see that by Heraclitus, he wants to push that a little bit further, right? So, for instance, if you go to uh, the first fragment here, we get the word. When he says the word, the, the actually, in the real translation is the logos, right? And so let's take a look at this passage here. Let's see if we can zoom in. Right. Right. It is wise to hearken, not to me, but to my logos, and to confess that all things are one. Right. So you see here that he's how because Heraclitus was also known as Heraclitus the Obscure because he would say things that are contradictory. Because here he's saying that all things are one, and then another passage saying that all things are constantly changing. Right. And then he keeps going to number two. Through this logos is true every, every more, yet men are as unable to understand it when they hear it for the first time. Right? When they fear it for the first time is before they have heard it at all. For through all things come to pass in accordance with this logos, men seem as if they had no experience of them when they make trial of words and deeds such as I set forth, dividing each thing according to its kind and showing how it truly is. But other men know not what they are doing when they are awake, even as they forget what they do when asleep. Right. So what is he saying in here? One of the things he's saying is that the, everyone has the Logos, right? Uh, and you can see it because all of us recognize unity in, thing, in things, but most of us don't recognize that we have the Logos, right? As if we're asleep, right? That we forget it as if we're asleep. Right. The other thing is that logos is what enables us to see how things truly are. Right. Where he says, "I set forth dividing each thing according to its kind and showing how it truly is, how it how it has its type of existence." Recall that today we're talking about reality. So here the idea is that logos um, gives me access to reality. Right. So I have an experience of things constantly changing, but logos. And here, I think maybe we should think about this notion of reason allows us to recognize somehow, it gives us access into reality, right? The, the third thing I want to mention here that is important with Heraclitus is what's known as what we might call the discovery of dialectical logic. And what's this idea? What do I mean by dialectical logic? Well, it's quite simple. It's the idea that all concepts are binary. That it, when I say binary, that means we're talking about opposites, right? So, for instance, you can't understand the concept of hot unless you understand the concept of cold, right? You can't understand the concept of light unless you understand the concept of heavy, right? And so on and so forth. And so, as a result, Heraclitus, in his fragments, he always is talking about opposites, right? Is that whenever we have one concept, in order to have it, there must be its corollary opposite. And he has this notion that truth is somehow the, 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 uh, the harmony uh, or the balance between these two sorts of opposites, these two, the, the binaries, the two opposites. And that knowledge is somehow contained in these oppositions, right? And so, for instance, we get, uh, let's see here, but I can find one here for you. Um, let me see if I go here. Uh, let's see. Oh, good. Here you go. 57 is a great one here, right? What does Heraclitus say? He says, good and ill are one, right? That's like saying good and evil are, are the same, right? You can imagine if you go out after watching this video and go walk out to someone and say, um, God, good and evil are the same, someone's going to be like, what are you talking about? But the idea here is that you, if you have the concept of good, you have to have this concept of bad or ill or evil. You can't have one without the other, which means that the good is not real itself, neither is the bad. Somehow, whatever it is that's real is, this oppos is, is, is contained in the opposition itself, which is how reason or logos operates. Right, so you have something of a discovery of reasoning here. Now it's very obscure here, and you don't get a lot of you don't get a lot of um, detail here. But you can see here that again, what Heraclitus is doing is he's drawing out these ideas 
that previously were really not thought through. And he's sort of abstracting what has to be the case. Notice in our first lecture, the taxonomy of philosophy, I said that metaphysics is the study of that which must necessarily be the case such that the world is as it is. And what we see here with Heraclitus is that we experience everything is changing, right? And yet there must be a logos that, that, that maintains our capacity to understand unity through time, right? And that it's always dialectical, right? You can see he's trying to deduce what has to be the case such that things are as they are, right? Um, and so we get, for instance, these sorts of quotations from him, right? All the things we see when awake are death, even as all we see in slumber are sleep, right? Or here's another one. The wise is only one. It is unwilling and willing to be called by the name of Zeus, <laughs> right? You can see there's that oppositional logic again, right? So, um, so it's very interesting. He has these sorts of things, right? And mortals are immortals, and immortals are mortals. The one living the other's death and dying the other's life, right? So he has this, this oppositional logic here, right? Um, and the other thing that's worth mentioning, though, there's a lot of debate about this, is that Heraclitus number four suggests that he seems to articulate that all is fire. And he talks a lot about fire and lightning and this sort of thing. Now, in the 19th century, people are, understood him to be or to saying something similar to Thales, but I don't, most people don't think that anymore. Most people think that when he talks about fire, fire is a good example of things changing, of flux, right? Because think about it, when something's burning, it's constantly changing. You can never grasp a flame, right? Because as soon as you do, the flame changes. So I think that his discussion of fire really exemplifies his discussion of change. Now, this isn't a, we haven't really answered the question of what is real, but what we can see here from our discussion so far today uh, when we talked about Thales, Anaximander, and Xenophanes, and Heraclitus, is we see something of a progression in ancient Greece in terms of from mythos to logos. We see this idea that Thales recognized we need a material explanation, not simply a narrative. Anaximander recognizes that we need that this material explanation um, has to be one that's fully logical. So it can't just be water. It's got to be a purine or infinite. And then with Xenophanes, we see a sort of direct attack against religion itself, or the mythology, the mythos of his day. And then with Heraclitus, we see an even deeper exploration between things changing and really exploring how it is, that if things are changing, what exactly is real, right? What is real when everything is constantly flowing? And it looks like what's real is contained in logos or reason. Right, and we're this is going to be important, especially in the next section. We're going to talk about Parmenides, and then the video after that, we'll talk about Plato, and we'll see that Plato. We're slowly building up the problems that eventually Plato and Aristotle are going to try to actually answer in a way that's much more satisfying. Okay, so this is our first session on the pre-Socratic philosophers, from mythos to logos, and I hope, if anything, you can get this sense of wonderment that these. Um, philosophers must have had in order to sort of explore these ideas and in order for us to really succeed in this class we need to do the same right so after you've done watching this video and you go throughout your day and you walk outside and you see the trees falling or you see the rain falling or the snow melting uh, or the sun shining right and the stars moving really sort of put yourself in their mindset if you had no knowledge of science whatsoever, right, uh, you would start asking this question, how is it that we can understand it um, in a way that goes beyond merely just giving a story? And what you'll see here is that these pre-Socratic philosophers are really something like the founders of science, right, the founders of science. And it's something very important here. Um, and really to grasp this, we've got to get that sense of wonderment as well, okay? Um, you know, it's interesting. Aristotle says philosophy begins in leisure, and it begins with wonder, right? And I hope that we can also at least get a, a glimpse of that wonder in this course as we continue to explore these ultimate questions, okay? Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys online next time. All right, bye.